product management and product design company in Paris and in Madrid. And I've been in product for the last 19 years now. Actually, I've always wanted, even as a kid, to work in technology. But I vividly remember never ever telling my parents, mom, dad, when I'm a grown up, I want to create Jira to get. No, because as a kid, I wanted to be a bad guy. I wanted to create breakthrough technologies and open new world and new possibilities. And at this time, you didn't have a word for that. And now there's a word everyone uses and fantasizes about disruption. But no one asked the real question, which is, if you had the power to disrupt, what would you do? Where would you start? Who would you work or not work with? And how could you anticipate the good and the bad consequences that will inevitably happen? Well, I didn't have the luxury not to find an answer to that question when I created my third company, a neurotech company 10 years ago. And I would tell you how I nearly opened the Pandora's box, why I sold the company for ethical reasons, and all the lessons that I've learned to give birth to more responsible digital products. So let's start with the technology. Everything you've been told about your brain being the control tower of your body is actually wrong because there's a whole system your brain has absolutely no control on and it's called the autonomous nervous system. It's a bit of the automatic pilot of your body in a way. It's like a network with your organs talking to each other where decisions are made, but everything is under your level of conscience. And it's encrypted by design, not to overwhelm your brain with information. So it means you don't have control to this information and your doctor don't, doesn't have control on this information. So, well, what we did is that we created a black box, just like in a plane. We control a black box to get information, then to decrypt it, and then using that black box, a sensor, to transform this data into information that will be actionable and insights given even to a system or to a doctor, for example. So it opened a new range of possibilities from diagnosing Alzheimer precociously to create immersion in the game, to try to understand PTSD or why a kid is unable to read or to calculate, or even to try to understand what happens in a baby in his brain when he's crying. So where do you start with such possibilities? Well, we chose to start with healthcare because we thought that it was the place where we would be understood and where we could have the best impact, which would be saving lives. But in that ocean, we actually met a whole range of fishes we didn't know about. And the first kind of fish that we met with were the suspicious fishes. So suspicious fishes were doctors. And the first suspicion they had was about the technology. Is it even possible to have access to all this information with a sensor and algorithms? And actually it was. So they accepted it, but then they said, well, what are you going to do with this? And we told them, well, we're going to help you diagnose and to get more, more information about the whole body. But the problem is that a lot of doctors, occidental doctors are specialized. So they focused on one part of the body and they ignore the links with the whole body itself. So there was no interest whatsoever. And there was a fear, an underlying fear, which was, okay, so are you telling me that your little technology is able to give a diagnosis or to replace me? We say, well, not to replace because it's just a machine. We need people like you. But it means that maybe, maybe the diagnosis that you made last week or two years ago was wrong. So there was a lot of fear about that. So they rejected it. Even if we met a lot, a lot of doctors from medical doctors to uh, pain doctors, there was so much hostility that after two years, we decided to stop working on the healthcare market. And it was already a punch in the stomach. 
So we went to actually met other people, another kind of fish. And it was the other optimistic fishes, people that had in mind, well, they, they understood what we could do. And they thought about use cases where you didn't have any market behind. Let's take that example of a vet who wanted to understand what was happening in the brain of a cat when he was doing this. Or vets that ask us, well, could you make a system that could give us information about the anesthetics that we need to give to a dog or to a cat before surgery? And we'd say, yes, because we may have the possibility to have um, actually an objective level of pain that is well felt by the body. The problem is that what they do today is that they give a standard dose based on the weight of your cat and dog. So if they give a little bit too much, well, the risk of having a problem is very thin, though there was no market behind. And actually, even if it's interesting, because you cannot ask a dog, well, between a range of one waff to 10 waff, how painful it is, well, actually, it had absolutely no economical future. And then we met a certain kind of fish, Sharks. So not this kind of shark, but more this kind of shark. It was investors or big companies, pharmaceutical companies, insurance companies, even entertainment companies that had heard about us, even if you were in stealth mode, and approached us to, well, cooperate. And I remember meeting a guy, a French guy from a big entertainment company, and he wanted to use our technology to create games because we were able to create immersion. So maybe trying to find a way so that the game could adapt to the, the human being to create infinite immersion in a way. So we asked him, okay, that's interesting, but what do you want to do with this? And the guy answered, well, I want to get people addicted to our games. It's free games, but if they are addicted, they're going to actually give us a lot of money. And he had absolutely no problem with that. So we say, well, no, no, because we have ethics. We have a moral compass. And this moral compass is our vision. So our vision was that we didn't want to contribute to a world where our principles were dead. And the problem is that when you tell that to a shark, it doesn't like it. So at the beginning, well, we felt a bit of a pressure during rendezvous like that. And then we received threats and then even death threats by mail or in our letterboxes. We were followed in the streets. And one day we got to the office. It had been ransacked. So imagine you want to create something that you think can change the world. And people treat you like that. And at this time, I really feared for my life and for my family. So, well, it's hard to actually swallow this, say, Matt, I don't want to create a weapon. Why do people think that I'm creating a weapon, a weapon that could be used for them in their benefits or against them? But the problem is that good intentions are not enough. If people think that you're creating a weapon, Maybe you are, even if you don't want to. So, well, with my partner, we thought, okay, we need to stop that thing. We need to stop that thing. We need to get it and bury it at the bottom of the garden and forget everything about it. But the day we decided to do this, uh, we had dinner with a guy in London and the guy asked us, well, are you still looking for a company that could provide you with better sensors? We said, well, yes. And the guy knew about a company in the Netherlands doing sensors and said, I, I think you should call them. So with my partner, we said, okay, that's the last chance. So we called them, went there and said, okay, if that doesn't work, we stop everything. So there's a demo. We show a demo to the guys in the Netherlands. And at the end of the demo, everybody stayed dead silent, pretty dead silent. And in my brain, I was really thinking about all the projects 
just like looking back at my life. And in France, we say un ange passe, an angel is passing. And to me, that was the angel of death who was passing. And then after, after a lot of seconds of silence, there's a guy who says, do you want to work with NASA? Well, if someone tells you this, you're not happy. You actually feel like this, which is, you're you kidding me. So NASA said, <laughs> let's be serious, guys. And actually, the guy was serious. They were working with NASA, creating sensors for them. And NASA had a big problem, two big problems, actually. The first one was the training. How can you be sure that your astronauts, when they are in the swimming pool training, are actually in the flow, that they really fear the danger, for example, when bad scenarios happen? And the second problem is that astronauts have a superhero syndrome. They think they are flawless. But when you send someone on the moon and to Mars and you are weeks or even months away from Earth, there are bad, strange things happening. Astronauts have been married for 20 years and actually get in love with each other. And the problem is that they didn't have a way, the NASA, to assess if an astronaut was in the conditions to take a critical decision. And a bad decision in a critical situation where you're in space has very, very bad consequences, as you can imagine. So we said, okay, let's sell you the technology, but on one condition, that you guarantee by contract that the technology will never ever be used by external actors, should it be public or private in any country? And they said yes. So if you ask me what is the special ingredients that allow you to sell your company to NASA, it was actually luck because I don't have the ego or not enough ego to take my smartphone and to call the NASA to say, hey, NASA, I'm Fabrice Denazoli, I want to work with you. But what did I learn from that experience? Well, the first thing is that we don't sell technology, we sell behaviors. That's actually what we measure. We measure DAU, MAU, acquisition, activation, retention. We don't sell technology. We sell a way for people to actually change or to reinforce their behaviors. That's why our power is huge. Not because we have a lot of money, but because the creations that we actually give birth to, should it be applications or web or hardware products, are everywhere. And they've changed the way that we meet and separate the way that we have fun and the way that we work. And people will say, well, yes, but big power, big responsibility, but I'm selling technology. And just like the NRA, we say, weapons don't kill, people kill. Yes. Well, I don't care about this. I don't care about the debate. I don't care who's responsible of misusing a technology. The fact is that the real question is who has the power to prevent it or to change it? And we have, we have, it's not the users that they have the power to prevent this. We have the power to not let that happen, to prevent it and to change how people can use the product that we sell. So in a way we are responsible just like parents are responsible of their children. We need to define the kind of education that we want for our products that do we want us to actually behave with the words. So can people trust our little product because it's honest, because it doesn't grab your attention when you don't want to, because it's reliable, because it's honest, because it takes care of each other, because it's predictable. Second part, it, does your children respect the planet or they just pollute it without any second thought? And the third, which is, is your product making profits on the back of other people, creating a dissymmetry of power or some kind of parasitism? 
Third thing, you need to prevent bad things from happening. So to stay away from weapon sellers or easy recipe sellers, people would tell you frameworks that you just have to apply to get what you want. And even to talk about the OKRs and North Star metrics, that can turn us into digital sociopaths because we just follow them without thinking about it, just because well, we have biases. Third thing, it's not because you can do something that you should do something. And the move fast and break things actually is not a good thing. Not because it was used by Facebook. The weak question is, is you cannot break people. That's what we could do because we're not setting technology, but behaviors. It means that the consequences of batting at scale will actually harm people. So it's not about limiting innovation. It's not about thinking about all the bad things that could happen. It's just saying what could go wrong and meeting with people that are not like us to say, well, can I harm you in a way I just couldn't imagine? That's why user research and consumption has to be responsible. So of course you cannot anticipate everything. And that's the beauty in technology. Unexpected things happen. The question is that, do you have a luxury not to anticipate, not to measure bad things? No, you don't, because it's not about innovation now. It's about negligence, and negligence has no room in our professions. So remember, our power is huge and good intentions are not enough. And if you want to give birth to responsible products, we must take responsibility as parents. We need to measure and act on the impact of our products on people, planet, and profits. We need to prevent all by challenging all the chef recipes and frameworks and ask upfront what could possibly go wrong and simply to be humble. It's not because we can do it that we should do it. Thank you. What a talk, what a talk. Fabrice, I, I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it and I'm seeing comments, people are enjoying it as well. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, a quick introduction to Fabrice. Um, Fabrice uh, created his first legal tech startup at 20 years old. He crashed it, which is what every 20 year old would do. Then he created two other ones in digital marketing and neurotech. I wouldn't have thought that would be the possibility, but he did and he sold them. After leading product and growth at Deezer, one of the few unicorns uh, in France, he now serves as Tiga's chief product officer, teacher, advisor, co-founder of LA La Product Conference and French CPO. He's an expert in product leadership and user engagement and a strong advocate for responsible product management and of diversity in technology. Well, Fabrice, uh, fabulous to have you with us today. Uh, what a talk. Um, I have a couple of questions coming in, but I'll sneak in one of mine. One, I'm sure <laughs> the audience will also appreciate that. It's the most important question, according to me. Where, how did you create that presentation? So many images, so many pictures, very, very unusual. <laughs> well, well, actually, um, if you want to go backward, even before that, um, uh, I didn't in, intend actually to create a whole talk on that topic. It took me something like four or five years to actually talk about that experience uh, because it was more a trauma than actually success. And it's still complicated to talk about it uh, because when you're threatened and when your life is threatened because of what you want to create, there's a bit of a, it, it looks like a, a really, really bad movie actually. Um, so yeah, uh, every time that I, I speak about that, um, I, anyway, I, I try to put some jokes. So I know that Ben, which is in the organization team, knows that I like to put jokes in such talks because I think it's so heavy if you don't. Um, so yeah, in trying to humanize technology, and that's something that we always should do. Um, metrics are good, but actually it dehumanize people. Uh, we tend to just forget that it's just there an aggregate of actions, individual action from people. And that's one of the few things that we do very, very badly in technology, remembering that there are people behind that and people that have lives out of our products. No. 
and I felt it was very on message of you to bring up the cover of the book Hooked before, uh, after you said the word behaviors. It was like, yeah, that's exactly what that means. So uh, I, I like that. All right, so I'll get some questions, a lot of questions coming in. First one is from Christine Ree. Uh, if you had a time machine and could give yourself advice uh, when you were starting this product, what would you say to yourself? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, I think I would tell myself do not do it. Don't just don't do it. Um, because the cost is too high, because the, the stakes are too high, because the risk are too high. Um, and it was too much power for someone. You know, I, I, I always have in mind the image at the end of the first Indiana Jones movie when they put uh, um, everything in a crate, uh, you know, even if uh, it, it get out at the end of the fourth movie, which is actually sure that never existed at all. Um, but I always have this in mind, which is you've created something and even if you try to, to delete it, um, you're never sure. Uh, by contract, NASA cannot get it out of NASA. But what if? What if someone takes it out of it? What if, I don't know, another Donald Trump becomes president and breaks everything? Everything's possible. So I would say just don't do it. Forget about it. Uh, work in a classical startup and live a happy life ever after. Lovely. Uh, she uh, has a follow-up question for you. How do you weigh the risks and benefits? Risk is inevitable. So at what point would you say the risk outweigh the benefits um, to it? Uh, and, uh, you know, how would you deal with that? Well, the, the big question is to me, um, the benefits for whom? Uh, usually we talk about benefits, potential benefits uh, in the future, and we are creating actual risks. So to me, what's sure are the risks? What sure are the arm that you can create? Uh, even if you have a vision saying that's not my vision because what I want to create, what I want to give to the world is something beautiful when people can be happy and whatever. Um, you don't know if it, this is going to happen. And if you can measure bad things now, well, you need to stop. You need to modif modify things. And in a way, um, there's something that usually we talk about, but not especially in startups. I have nothing yet in startup, but um, only in startup or product or whatever, is that we give ourselves the right to take risks that we don't have to assume. We take risks because people take risks by using or not using our products. And I don't think we have the right to do this. Personally, I think we don't. I think we lack humility in a way, a little bit. Um, so the good thing is actually to do some pre-mortem, try to just to say what could go wrong and shouldn't we list it? The second thing is talk about the stress cases, which is which things could actually go bad, not bad, I'd say so so bad that people can be killed, even if it could happen, but um, just think about the stress cases. Uh, don't think about personal, just like people that are really happy and nothing's happening to them and they have all the time in the world to spend within your product. It's, it's wrong. And the third thing actually is to try to measure those things. So one of the great things from Google is the goal signal metrics um, framework. And you could do exactly the same thing with anti-goals, anti-signals, anti-metrics. Which kind of behavior would I observe if things are going wrong? Which is a bit of a guarantee against bad things. And then when at the end, if unexpected things happen that are actually bad things, don't say you're not responsible because we don't care about that. That's what I was saying in the talk. We don't care about the responsibility. We care about power. Can you do something about it or not? And if you don't, it's going to be too late and you're going to be, become another Facebook or Google or YouTube, whatever. Or worse than either, yeah. Well, I was going to say, if you become one of those, you're going to make a lot of money. I still don't know what is wrong with that. But, you know, I, I see your point. Point well made. Um, next one is from Olga. It's a little more... It's a little, a little different from our usual question, slightly philosophical. If you were a VC, which top three features and or value propositions would you want in a product to invest in? Wow. <laughs> that, that's a very large question. And actually being not a VC at all and a pure product guy, uh, I actually never thought about it. 
Um, I don't think I would care about features, actually. Uh, that's so not features in more value proposition. But, and when people say I invest in a vision, which usually what my friend VC told me, yeah, yeah, we don't care about your product. We care about the team and the vision. And that's right. I think I would actually invest in people that uh, think about what they want to create, but think about what they don't want to create. Uh, which would be the signals that would make you stop. I remember a wonderful article from, I, I don't remember his name, I'm very sorry about, about that, but uh, he invented what they call survival metrics to know when you have to invest or to pivot or to stop. And I think I will actually uh, ask the people uh, that are creating such a product to say, uh, let's talk about survival metrics. Which kind of signals do you see that you think you should invest more into that feature or that market or whatever? Uh, and the pivot and the stop. And if they don't have any stop and they haven't thought about the bad things, I won't invest. But well, I actually, I, I would, don't think I would ever be a VC. So don't take my word uh, as a, something very, very serious. Okay. <laughs> well, never say never. 10 years from now, at least <laughs> <a> VC. <laughs> <It's Possibly. laughs> Uh, next one is from John Park. This is uh, slightly, again, different from the usual question uh, you get asked. So as a product builder, any suggestions on balancing long-term product excellence in the face of pressure to deliver from a CEO and business stakeholders? Uh, such a classical question. <laughs> uh, definitely. Um, usually what I say, uh, even with business, is that I get back to strategy. Um, the pain is that usually, well, how can I say that without being rough? Uh, I think a lot of people, even CEOs, don't know what a strategy is and they don't have any strategy. So they have ambition. We want to be first at this or we want, I don't know, XXX million dollars of GMV, whatever. Um, so there's just an ambition and whatever the cost, uh, they think that an objective is enough to actually say it's a strategy, which is wrong. Uh, what you usually see when you have business stakeholders, and especially when they want specifics, uh, the classical thing when you are a product or engineer, so we need to do that for XX because it's a big customer, or if I have that, I know I can sell it. Which is like, yeah, you serious guy? <laughs> yeah, no, you're, you're the first guy who's actually saying that to me. Wow, wow, that's impressive. Which is um, the Greek question to me is first thing, are they conscious of the arm? Second thing, which are the incentives? Because to me, it's a really question, especially with sales people, which is, well, it's pretty logical that your behavior is based on your incentives. If you're incentivized to do a behavior, well, you'll do it. That, that's pretty logical, okay? That, that's psychology 101. Uh, and if my objective is so far from yours, well, we cannot agree. So the only thing that we can agree is that we're going to disagree. Um, the real question to me is, um, if it doesn't go and fit in strategy, which is why do those guys feel obliged to ask you this? There's a problem mm -hmm. somewhere, which is not their fault and which is not your fault. You need to um, do an escalation in a way to, to talk about it because if there's a problem, maybe we are actually investing in the wrong part of the product as product guys and product engineers or, or, or product managers uh, all alike. Um, there's a problem of investment somewhere. So it, it might be more serious than what we think. Uh, and if you have a CEO just telling you to do this or that, the real question is, well, his or he, she's a bo the boss. So if he asks that, I don't say it's not your company. So, well, sometimes just need to back off. Um, that's not my character. I think I just say no and quit. Uh, but that's just me. I'm not telling you to quit. I uh, don't want your boss to call <laughs> me tomorrow. Okay. Uh, uh, well, Fabrice, uh, last minute then, probably just one question from me. You, you build so many different kinds of products. Any uh, any patterns, any learnings, any cross-product, cross-technology, cross-domain wisdom to share with the, with the attendees? Well, to me, they said the one thing, which is really true, is that uh, even if you think that you know everything about your market and your market is fair as classic rules and whatever, uh, the best thing you could do is to get inspired from other markets. That's every time in the world, that's where innovation happens. So don't, be an expert in your market if you want to, but 
not get out of the building is get out of your or your neighborhood. Uh, go and see people from B2C if you're in B2B, hardware if you're in software. We have so many things to learn from other products and so many other patterns and so many meta patterns that you can find that would make you a, a great product builder. Fabrice, I thoroughly enjoyed moderating this. Thank you for your time today. Uh, thoroughly you. enjoyed the presentation. Uh, deep, insightful answers. Uh, please, uh, participants, please hang out in the lounge and uh, hang in to ask Fabrice any questions. But uh, thank you very much today uh, and have a good evening.